about whether the magnetic compact of birds involve a coherent quantum reaction. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, photosynthetic uh, processes, and you can give a fairly detailed description on a physics basis what's going on there and whether coherence is involved. The question that's harder to answer is whether that's relevant at all for the biological function. Here we have the inverse situation. We have something where the biological relevance is very clear. And the question is, is there indeed a quantum process underlying that? So let me first start out, since this is split differently between the speakers than in Solvay, so my colleague is a physical chemist, so I'll talk more about the biology and give an overall overview to lead into this topic rather than going right into the physics. Birds migrate and they, let's see, um, are quite clever about this in fact. You know, they, they use, you know, sometimes roots that make them avoid mountains or big oceans. Um, but they're not really, you know, smart. When we think about bird brains, we generally don't think about something, you know, highly intellectual. And they have a brain that weighs, you know, a few grams. And yet they can manage to do this, which we would be challenged to do without GPS systems and probably even with GPS systems. One of the things that helps them is a magnetic compass in this, and it's just one of the systems. So they have a sun compass, a star compass, and so on. But we'll mm -hmm. just talk about the magnetic compass. And how do we know that they have that? Well, this is the bird that we talk about a lot, European robins and migrants um, in Europe, short-distance migrants. And when, uh, so all of the research, by the way, I want to point out um, that started this is done by the village goes here in the natural habitat, you know, looking for birds and going around. And what they found is that if you place a bird during migratory season in a cage, even in this cage, it wants to hop north or south. It's so desperate to do this. So it, it makes a very easy way to monitor this. Um, you could either have a camera to look where it goes, or the low-tech version is you have um, a funnel, and then you put some scratch paper there, like the old Tipex typewriter paper or something else. And then in this, the bird can you know, flutter around, um, but it can't really fly. And you can leave scratch marks. And they'll be all over, but there's clearly a preferred direction, which coincides with the expected migratory direction. And then you can build coils and turn your magnetic field. And what you see is that then you turn the headings of the birds. And so what these triangles mean is this is, you normally test one bird several times, three times or so, and then this is the average heading of one bird, and then each triangle is another bird. And then you have the grand mean average, and you see there's clearly directional sensitivity. It's a nice lab experiment. You take away other cues they might have, like the sun and so on, and just give diffuse light. And you see that they have a magnetic compass. And that's what I refer to as the magnetic compass. It's not limited to migratory birds. Chickens uh, and, and other animals uh, have that too. It's a bit harder to ask them um, because these are very desperate to go north or south, so it's very easy to ask them where do you think is north. Um, it's much harder for the birds that you have to train first. But it's not linked to migration, it's just easier to ask these animals. Now, this is an old study. Uh, what have we learned since then? There are a couple of properties that are interesting. If I had a compass needle that's pointing north, and I flip the vertical component of the field, but the horizontal stays unchanged, my compass needle would point in the same direction because I haven't changed the horizontal component. If you do the same experiment with a the bird, they actually move in the opposite direction. The corollary to that is if you flip the vertical, if you reverse the polarity of the magnetic field, they keep going in the same direction. And if you look at the field lines, they of course are perpendicular at the poles and then zero at the equator. And what the genetic program sees, seems to be is that the bird says, I want to go to where it's warmer. And that's where the angle of the magnetic field with the horizon gets shallower. And that's what they pick up, this dip angle or inclination angle is really important to them. And it works on both hemispheres, and it also works if the magnetic field repolarizes, which it does on geological timescales every 100,000 years. So it's kind of clever to actually throw away the, the polarity information and just pick up that inclination information. Now, from a physicist's point, there are really two ideas that are discussed very heavily as the potential mechanism underlying this. So I want to present the first one which is that there are magnetic particles that are underlying. So this is not quantum, this is not classic. that have ferromagnetic crystals. And in birds, you find a system in the beak that clearly looks like a magnetic sensory structure. You have to be careful when you find iron. It could be just a deposit of the metabolism or things like that. But this is a nerve ending, so there's some clear indication that, that there should be 
uh, something interesting here. It's quite different than the uh, mag uh, magnetic system you find in the bacteria. There you have ferromagnetic crystals. Here they're much bigger and you expect to have a vortex pattern. And the question is why, and it's an interesting question. Um, one of them is, is actually, although these magnetic bacteria can be reoriented by the magnetic field because you're above thermal energies, it's hard to get great forces out of them. That's not sensing, that's just passive alignment. If you really want to, you know, open a mechanosensitive ion channel, you need to generate some force. And you can't, you get sort of 0 0.05 piconewtons, which is very small. And you can't easily increase that, because if you increase the length, well, force is torque divided by length, so you don't increase the force. If you increase the particles, well, you lose the single domain patterns. Um, what you could do is change maybe the magnetization by going from iron to cobalt or something, but that doesn't seem to happen in biology. So you're really sort of stuck with, with, with this. And here there may be different ideas that maybe you generate gradients and then you have a particle of high susceptibility here that's put in. So these are things that are being discussed. But one of the things you can test is you take the system out. You either destroy it, anesthetize it, cut the nerve that goes from there to the brain and ask, does the magnetic compass of birds still work? And the answer is yes, they find north just as before. There is absolutely no difference, no matter what you do to this system. So then you can say, if you believe in iron oxides, well, maybe there's a second system we just haven't found yet somewhere. Um, and how could we test for that? Well, you could zap birds with a strong magnetic pulse to remagnetize the material. Um, and then you should see effects. Um, so what you would do is you want to first take the system out to make sure that this is not where you get your effects from. And then you give the strong magnetic pulse. And what you see is there's again no difference. So that seems to rule out that there's another iron oxide based system that is, you know, we just haven't found yet. So what could be the other idea? That have been, um, I'll skip this for a moment if I have time, I come back. Um, yeah. So, going back to the compass, the other idea is that you might have a light induced radical pair reaction. This was proposed by Paul Schulten actually a long time ago. <laughs> what you get then are two molecules where you have each an unpaired electron spin, so two radicals. These electron spins will, in the simplest model, have different nuclear spin environments, and therefore you will get um, different spin evolution of these two electron spins. You start out in a completely polarized state or completely in a singlet state, so you're all ordered in the beginning. And so then you get precession of these molecules, so you get changes between singlet and triplet states and back. And that you get without an external magnetic field. <coughs> now what's important is that this is not the final step, but you decay now in a spin-selective fashion. So you have a singlet product line and triplet product line. In the most general case, it could be that you could only form products out of one state, or so the different kinetic setups on the imagine here. Now, if you add the Zeeman interaction to this in the external field, you change the dynamics of this coherent interconversion, and therefore you change the concentration of the products that you get out. So you change their downs. And um, so that once you have a concentration change in the product, you can do signal transduction and you can you know, activate some biochemical cascade. Um, at the heart of this, and, and uh, uh, Chris will talk more about this, is you actually need some symmetry in your zero field Hamiltonian. Because the, normally the hyperfine calcings are stronger than the um, geomagnetic field, and so it's kind of puzzling how a weak geomagnetic field can have an effect. And it can have, if you're a zero field Hamiltonian that's set up with the hyperfine calcings only, has some degenerate states that are then, when these degenerate states are lifted to the external field and their coherence is linking these states, you can have effects. How do we get the symmetry? We haven't analyzed in great detail. One way you can do it is if you have one radical that has hyperfine couplings and the other one that doesn't. So that would be an easy way to do this. And it's a free electron radical pair, we'll, we should call. We'll come back to this one. Now, all I've mentioned so far is just a magnetic sensor, a magnetometer. I haven't talked about a compass. How do you get the compass? Well, for one radical, you get anisotropic hyperfine interactions, in particular of nitrogen atoms, but also of methyl groups. And what they do is you normally get sort of an, an axial pattern, which is sort of a sine to theta like pattern um, in terms of the sensitivity of the um, one, the, these radical pair reactions of one radical pair and the angle with the external kinetic field. Now that's one radical. You need multiple ones to actually generate a signal. So we need to assume that you have multiple radicals ordered in some way. Ideally, you want radical pairs that are in a protein, that protein ideally bound inside a membrane, and then that membrane may be stacked like in, in photoreceptor cells. 
So let's assume uh, for the moment that you have photoreceptor cells that are perpendicular to the retina, as we know they are, and that they are filled with radical pairs um, that are all perfectly ordered. And then the magnetic field here at this one would have a different effect than the uh, magnetic field here. And you can just read this off, this pattern, and then you project it back and you say white means less yield and you know, dark means more yield. And we plot this modulation of this, the light signal that we we'll get from these things. And you can do this when the eye points in different directions and you calculate it again. And you get these kinds of patterns. There are signal modulation patterns. And that's, you know, the conceptual um, interpretation that, that helps us to analyze this. Um, a couple of things I should mention. You can ask, you know, what is the best nuclear spin environment to get um, strong magnetic field effects and directional effects? Some things you find is you can do that analytically if you have very few hyperfine couplings. You want to have on one molecule no hyperfine coupling. On the other radical, you want to have a large one with a long spin correlation time. And then it doesn't really matter how large you get. So once you sort of there's a plateau region where it doesn't matter what, what the parameters are. And you want it to be strongly anisotropic, ideally. You know, that also makes sense. Uh, the interesting thing is if you add other couplings, for example, strong isotropic couplings, here this is like um, about 100 times stronger than the, the, the anisotropic one, they don't destroy your anisotropy. So what's plotted here is always the difference between the max, so the, the, the maximal effect of the magnetic field and then the angle where you have the, the minimal effect. And you see there's still sort of 8-9% difference even if you have isotropic couplings that are much, much stronger. Um, so this, the simple arguments of saying what's the strongest interaction is the geomagnetic field stronger than that, they don't necessarily apply when you, when you think about this. Now, what I presented here is really the simplest model. And as a physicist, while we don't know anything about the molecules, we're free to say, let's build the simplest model that shows the phenomenon, which is ionisotropic hyperfine couplings plus Zeeman interaction. And of course, I know there are other interactions, um, that spin spin interactions, that need to be taken into account in a real molecule. One argument one can make is if you have a rather distal radical pair, these couplings, electrons change and dipolar, will be reduced. Um, it's hard to see that you can reduce them enough that they become completely negligible within one protein, but you also see that the effects can cancel each other, so that, you know, this is not the final end of the story, and once you know more about the molecule, we'll have to do this more detailed modeling. One key feature is you need to have long enough spin correlation times for these effects to evolve, something on the order of microseconds to the very least. Um, another feature that has been discussed quite a bit is what if you have, don't have a completely ordered system, you have static disorder, you know, do you destroy the complex? And the answer is not very quickly, it's actually fairly insensitive to disorder. Um, you can disorder it in two dimensions completely, as long as you restrain it in one dimension a little bit, you will maintain um, complex sensitivity quite well, actually. Now, when you look at these patterns um, and, and use them as a guide, you can see some things. For example, there's a symmetry around the north-south axis. So that is something a bird could pick up fairly quickly if it were to move, for example, its head a little bit. And so then we went back and asked biologists, do you see this? And indeed, you know, they glued strips and looked at that and saw that there's some behavior of birds where they actually twitch their head before they make the orientation decision. They go left, right, 90 degrees for several times, six, seven times and then they fly. Now this could just be a nervous twitch or it could be linked to them, you know, finding this out. You can never tell on the basis of such an experiment. You also find that if you analyze these patterns, there's no difference between a bird looking north on the northern hemisphere and south on the southern hemisphere. They distinguish pole bird from equator bird. Just as we saw, there's this inclination compass and it comes out of the quantum mechanical symmetries of the anisotropic couplings. You don't need to have some ad hoc assumptions to explain that. Now, is there any evidence that this is actually what's going on? It's a nice idea. Uh, first of all, you expect there should be light effects, since if this is a light-induced electron transfer, and so one can test this. You can't really do it under complete darkness, because then the bird usually sits there. Um, they've, recently, they've overcome this, but so before that, what people have done is you give different monochromatic lights. What you find is that under short wavelength light, um, you get good orientation, the pluses here. And then there's a fairly sharp cutoff, around 570 nanometers, where if you have now a longer wavelength, you get disorientation. 
And that's similar in quite different birds, in fact. Um, so it could tell you that maybe the molecule that initiates the radical pair process has an absorption spectrum in the blue-green range, and if you don't hit that, you don't get the reaction. Or the other interpretation would be, well, if you wake up and the world is red, you may be nervous and you just may panic and don't care about <laughs> migration. And again, you can't distinguish on the basis of such an experiment what's going on. This is always careful. To, one has to think about these things. Um, is there a molecular candidate? And there has been now for a while, and it's called a molecule cryptochrome, a blue-green light photoreceptor. And it's so far still the only photoreceptor known in birds that actually forms radical pairs. It has some nice features. For example, you have you know, uh, different axes of anisotropies aligned, so you keep you know, nice uh, magnetic sensitivity, directional sensitivity. Very recently, this work by the British Schools, um, one found that cryptochromes are actually expressing the outer segments of the UV receptors in the photo, uh, the cone receptors in the eye of birds. They're distributed all over the retina, so this is a whole mount of the retina. And you can see these are the, the black dots of the cryptochromes that are right in there, you know, where you know, would hope them to be, in fact, for a good directional sensor. Um, so there is a molecule that seems to have some kind of ordering and, and is in the right place. Um, so that's promising. There are magnetic field responses on, regulation, on uh, reactions regulated by cryptochrome. So we said, well, if there's something about cryptochrome, maybe we see magnetic field effects. And so we looked at it in plants, and we saw a number of responses. And every time the plant behaved when we increased the magnetic field, as if it were to see more light in, in, in this condition. Um, there were issues with reproducing that. The Peter Hall group couldn't find these things, so one needs to be careful when, when it's early days. There's a lot of variation, usually, and it has to be worked out. There's similar effects on fruit flies finding, you know, picking one direction over the other, depending on whether there's a magnetic field or not. And again, functional cryptochrome was necessary. So if you knocked out the cryptochromes in plants, you didn't see an effect. If you knocked them out here, you didn't see these effects. And there's another paper on the circadian rhythm in fruit flies, again linked to cryptochrome. It's still an open question. I mean, we, we, when you look at magnetic field effects on cryptochrome directing the protein, they're fairly small this one, that may be that we don't have the right genetic network. And also from a physics perspective, I couldn't really tell you why cryptochrome is so special. When you look at this you know, cofactor, it doesn't look all that different from any other molecules that you could have. There is an effect that you seem to have long-lived coherence um, in here. So this is an EPR transit EPR measurement by cousin of cryptochrome photolysis, where you do see EPR signals going out at tens of microseconds. So that's, of course, helpful. Um, but at this point, it's really still early days. We can't really answer that question. But it's a very promising candidate. The next thing is, what's the neural signaling? Um, and, and the very, uh, all I want to say here is, if this is a vision-based thing that is starting out in the eyes, well, you ought to have some brain center that processes this information, that sits in the, that, that gets information from the eyes. And there's one that has been identified through um, a, um, early gene markers, so you, you look, you let the bird orient, and then you look at what cells are active during that time, and what neurons are active, and you find this lighted area, it's called cluster M, which is linked to the eye, it's a visual center, it requires input from the eye, and there's actually only one link to the eye, one synapse, as one says. And then the most important thing is, if you delete the center, you lesion it, the magnetic compass doesn't work anymore, the birds are disoriented. But if you now, um, you know, look at other compasses, the star and sunset compass, they still work. So that's results by the Morrison group in all the work, and that very strongly suggests that this is a magnetic information center linked to the eye. Finally, um, the results I was involved in a lot was to say, can we probe this, this direct, this response here a little bit more? If really similar triplet interactions are at the heart of this, then you should be able to create another source of noise or of spin flips by coming in with oscillating fields that have this splitting between singlet and triplet speed. Um, uh, states, and they should be in the radio frequency range. Since we don't know the molecule, I can't tell you exactly you know, wh where the resonances are, so I can give you sort of a general range. Um, and the problem is, I only have very few conditions where I can actually test what's going on, because you need to, it's this, you can't just put it in spectrophotometer and measure it. This is um, about eight data points you can generate per year, because it means in each of these conditions you need to take a bird, test it enough to see whether it's oriented or not, and uh, you can only do it during migratory season. So you have to have some idea of what you want to do when you go in there. So what we did is we started out with a broadband field to see do we hit a resonance somewhere, and 
between 100 kilohertz and 10 megahertz. And we got this orientation. So this is now you take the bird, you do the normal magnetic uh, orientation experiment, and then you add on top of that this weak oscillating field, about a hundredth of the, even less than the geomagnetic field. And then we went to single frequencies. And so what happened there is if you take, this is an uh, intensity which is exactly one hundredth of the geomagnetic field. And you see this orientation at these higher frequencies, and at lower ones, you see a transition region and then no effect. That's what you expect. Imagine you have a lifetime of one microsecond, then a hundred hertz field or something will be static, and adding a very weak static field of one percent doesn't change your orientation. So that transition could give you information about the lifetime or its correlation time to the relative pair, which is suggested to be on the order of two to ten microseconds based on this data. That's one way of interpreting the other ways, but so that's sort of maybe the most straightforward one. Now you could say again, if you're a devil's advocate, well, okay, maybe these birds have um, a radio frequency sensor. Maybe if they sense these radio frequency fields, they get nervous and they panic, and that's why you get this orientation. It has nothing to do with the compass. And uh, there is, however, something we can respond to that. Um, we know um, from selection rules that you need to put your oscillating field perpendicular to the static field to get an effect. So if we now take our field and make it parallel to the bird, to the um, static field, orientation of the bird comes back. And the important condition is this one. We now take our oscillating field, and it has the same angle to, with respect to the birds as in this condition, because the birds are free to move in the horizontal. And so if this was some non-specific effect of the oscillating fields, you would expect that these two conditions, where you have the same intensity, same frequency, and same angle of the oscillating field with respect to the bird, would give you the same effect. But what you see is here you get this orientation, and here you don't, clearly showing that you have a resonance effect with something that's directionally sensitive in there. Now, if you really want to be devil's advocate, you can say, okay, I believe you, there's a directional sensitive radical pair reaction, but how do you know it's part of the compass? And I find this a somewhat disingenuous criticism, because for 40 years we've looked for one reaction that is uh, magnetically sensitive, and now people turn it around and say, well, there may be multiple ones, but they're just not involved in the compass, right? Um, but you can test that too by similar experiments where you look at other orientation responses and see that they're not affected by these oscillating fields. So this is specific to the magnetic compass. Then we also look at you know, specific frequencies, in particular the free electron down frequency. Um, remember that you know, uh, when you have a free electron, no hyperfine couplings, that's very good for um, you know, uh, interactions and then for detecting magnetic fields. And we see that at this frequency, you are very sensitive. Um, so that this is resonance, you can go down to 50 nanotesla and still see an effect of the oscillating field. So this is, you know, the the result of about five years of work um, going back and forth, we see this very sharp resonance at uh, you know, 1.3 megahertz, the free electron lambda frequency in the field in Frankfurt. This test, by the way, I should mention, is not limited to the migratory birds. We applied it to chicken, we applied it to mole rats, which are a blind subterranean animal where people think they have um, a magnetite iron oxide based complex, and there are no effects here, so it's a good control. Uh, compared to that. Um, we looked at, uh, in fact, people have now looked also at zebra finches and at uh, cockroaches, which seem to have very similar mechanisms. So I hope I've convinced you that we've learned something about the physical mechanism, that there's some spin chemistry involved ultimately at the base of the compass. Can we say a little bit about the receptor molecules? What about this free electron idea? So if you have you know, typical molecules that have you know, hyperfine couplings, you expect two broad resonances in kind of spectrum like we got, that are you know, linked with the average of the hyperfine couplings on the two molecules. Um, but what we see is something like this, a very sharp resonance, and you can show that this really uh, I mean, uh, can only occur if you indeed have a free electron in there. And you can also make some more predictions. If this is a free electron, well, one of the things you expect is that you get a shift of the resonance according to the Lama frequency. So you retrain the birds to orient in twice the geomagnetic field. I mean, once they can do it, then you do this oscillating field test again. And now we see that the, the resonance has shifted to twice the frequency, and there's no effect as before, just as you would expect um, in this case. And also, you know, this uh, effect that there's no high frequency field effect if it's parallel is actually strictly only to be expected in this situation. So it strongly suggests that we have a free electron radical pair in here, and the question is how could 
be realized? That's a very hard question to answer at this point. And we're, you know, we've had one idea that it may be the back reaction from uh, in the cryptochrome when it gets reoxidized that there's some oxygen form that's apart, but that, that doesn't seem to match the patterns of what we have when you look at this. So um, this is still an open question at this point. I'd like to have I run to this too fast. You didn't give me five minutes. Yeah, okay, because I'm almost done. So let me um, point out that we have, when you look at this mechanism, which initially was sort of an almost an academic footnote, I mean, most people believe that, that magnetite is the way to go in, in Earth. But if you look at the evidence that's there now, it, it's actually quite broad. I mean, we have an idea that there may be a radical pair mechanism. We have a candidate, the cryptochromes, and some evidence that may be involved. We have evidence for the eye being involved in neural pathways. Um, there's a little bit of genetics and, and hints of this. Um, there's, of course, big things missing. I mean, we don't have neurophysiology having elect you know, electrophysiological readouts. We don't have real genetics of deleting it in the bird and reintroducing it. There are just no transgenic birds. But it's certainly you know, on, on quite a good footing at this moment to go forward. It's also nice that we can you know, use predictions that come from solving spin Hamiltonians and, and try to you know, directly <laughs> test them in the birds. And it seems to work quite well, in fact, as you might expect in a sensory system, when you know, you, you, the sensory biological systems are often limited by physics. You know, the absorption spectrum of a blue light photoreceptor you could calculate, and then you know where they can you know, find blue light, and similarly you could you know, get some insights about this. I'd like to tease you and, and end by actually going back. I've talked about the compass all the time here, um, but that is not all the geomagnetic field uh, seems to do and um, seems to be used for. And so I'd like to just um, end by pointing out something which is much, much harder to explain than the compass. Um, to just leave you with maybe more puzzling. Mm -hmm. It's called magnetic signposts. You take, for it's, it's easiest to explain sea turtles. You take a freshly hatched sea turtle in Florida, you tether it um, in a harness, and so then it can swim, and you can see which way it swims. What they do is they go in big currents. We know they're from Finding Nemo, right? So they, they, <laughs> and, and what, you know, what the East Australian current is in the Pacific is this North Atlantic gyre in the Atlantic. And they need to stay in this. They're actually pretty bad swimmers, so they need to you know, stay in this. And, um, for example, they can't go to the Gulf Stream, which splits off here, um, because then they would have go into frigid Arctic waters and die. So they need to stay in there. So you give a freshly hatched sea turtle the magnetic field it would encounter at this point, where it has to make orientation decisions, and it responds by swimming in a direction, namely south in this case, that would keep it in this gyre. And you could go, and people have done that, you know, you can even go sort of like over here, and then you see it's sort of a little bit southeast, and over here more southwest, and so forth. So people have uh, traced that out over many years. And um, that's a fascinating thing when you think about it. This is, um, it hasn't migrated, it doesn't know what the conditions are. This is somehow implanted in the genes to know if you encounter a magnetic field, respond by swimming in one direction. It's, um, you know, I mentioned reproducibility issues. This has been reproduced over quite some time. You see similar effects, for example, in birds. Before they cross a big desert, they fatten up to make sure they have enough of a reservoir. And you can again trigger that um, by giving the magnetic field just north of the desert at the right time, so sort of like enough days after they start migration that they would expect to be there, and then you get them fattened in the lab. Um, how does it work? We have no idea, um, but maybe that big organ is involved in some way, um, but there's certainly you know, much more to do. So with that, I'd just like to end by thanking you for your attention and having you know, all the people involved, my students, uh, collaborators, the show is very glad to work with them, um, plant person, Margaret Arman, and Cryptochromes, the whole group, and funding. Thank you very much. really nice to uh, see something where it seems like you found quantum mechanics without starting out uh, looking for it in biology. Um, so I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Um, I forget almost everything that I once read about cryptochrome, except knowing that the name means that it was mysterious at one point. Um, you had some molecules that you showed at a couple points. Um, is one of those the chromophore cryptochrome, or is the chromophore known? Yes, so, so, so the name cryptic, cryptochrome comes from cryptic chromophore, and it comes from the following observation. If you're blind, 
um, you still get jet lagged. So your internal clock gets reset by light. So there need to be some other chromophore, other photoreceptor that tells you there's light outside and that was the cryptic chromophore. It was first discovered in 98 to be cryptochromes in fruit flies. Um, and so then it was named this way. Ironically, in humans and mammals, it's not cryptochrome, it's melanopsin, which has been found later, so it's sort of a misnomer in this way. The, the cofactor that's bound is flavin, it's the active cofactor that, that is involved in that cycling of the different oxidation states. That's known. It's the same as in photolyase, in fact, that that part is very much conserved. Um, sometimes you get an activation through first a mechanism through another um, light absorber that's there, pterin, but that's not so important. It's just sort of the switching on and it shift the absorption spectrum. But the functional part is the flavin. The partner is much harder to say. So there is an activation cascade that involves amino acids in electron transfers um, when doing the photo activation. But we, we know sort of the intermediate radical acid form, but we don't know where the electron actually comes from at the very end. Um, and you, you see that tryptophanes and tyrosines involved in sort of a multi-step cascade. So that's, you know, yeah. um, and, and actually I just want to comment on this. this um, maybe I didn't point it out enough, but you got it. It's, this is inherently quantum mechanics. You need the coherent step in there. So there's no way to just have some classical in there. So that, and that's why it's intriguing, yeah. How, how, how about the small of, of the magnetic energies in the world relative to KT? There are several orders of magnitude below that, um, and, and, the, and, and it's not really, this is not an equilibrium situation, so, so this equilibrium argument doesn't really apply, because no, you, you're in a completely order... Equilibrium, we're talking about thermal fluctuations there. Yes, but what you need to ask is, what is the rate of spin flips you get through thermal fluctuations compared to the rate of spin flips you get through the um, external magnetic field? And it's a very different question than asking, you know, what, what are the different energies? So, so this fight actually has been sort of waged in, in the spin chemistry community, and you have you know, in the 70s, it was very much, you know, you know, people didn't want to believe it. But by now, there's, you know, 30 years of, of research looking at effects <laughs> orders of magnitude below KT. And, and so that's very well established. And we'll actually see in the next talk even Earth strength magnetic field effects. Yeah. Uh, didn't get it. Do you actually know what is cryptochrome? Uh, the cryptochrome is in the eye. I mean, in the eye, there is a membrane, there is rhodopsin and things like that. Have they actually found it there? Yes, so, so you have seen in this one plot that I showed you with an antibody, there is cryptochrome in the UE receptor in the outer segment in eyes. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be between the, the, the discs where you have the rhodopsins. And it seems to be associated with the membrane there. So not inter integral membrane protein, but someone that's, that's bound to the membrane there. Um, mm -hmm. So that's as far as it goes at the moment. That's a very new result. It's actually unpublished still. And um, so, yeah. Sorry, so, so it is expressed in humans, it's called again... No, it's still called cryptochrome, it's still but called in, cryptochrome. in us it's... Um, so it, uh, cryptochrome is involved in regulating circadian rhythms, day and night rhythms. Okay. So it's part of oscillators, and in, in, in mice, for example, it's just part of the oscillator binds with period and timeless and other of these. Problems. And the same for us, presumably by extension, but we don't know. And that. yeah, we don't know, and I, I don't know what the latest is in, in that field, but, but you know, that one could explain And then on, on mice, there are transgenic mice, have they done knockout experiments with the, the cryptochrome and it messes up their circadian rhythm? Yes, setting? so yes, okay, that, that's how you know. Yeah. I see, okay. Pardon? Um, in the uh, radical energy of the Exactly sure to what controversy you're referring at that point. So there's, um, I mean, there's there's differences in the kinetics you could set up, which are I, I think not not really highly critical for this. There's questions of other interactions that have been neglected, whether they're important. Um, there's questions about the interpretation of the oscillating field spectrum um, that you know again, are sometimes hard to do because it's hard to give quantitative results if you really don't know the molecule. And, and so, um, so I'm not exactly sure if you, if you know a bit more specifically what, what, what that was. I could probably give you a more specific answer there. He's talking about uh, Ionis Caminus's quantum xeno effect. Oh, the xeno effect. And then block correction to the... Yeah, I don't see that this is what, what's happening at all. I mean, it's, it's so... I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an idea that has been forwarded, but... A lot of sense in, in 
this context. So, yeah. Yeah. I would like to ask one question. So, from a theory point of view, what would you say is a key of the question regarding this research? I would say we don't know really if you were to design a, a magnetic compass sensor out of two spins that are in a biological environment in a protein you know, that, that you create in this radical reaction, um, what do you have to do for this to make it work at room temperature? What is really the best, both nuclear environment as well as the kinetics, as well as the, you know, maybe the protein interaction with this? Um, most of the guidance you get when you ask this question is coming from you know, things at 4K, how do you build a magnetometer when you can, you know, reduce all of these fluctuations and so on, which you can't in this situation. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, is, is what, what I would really like to know, you know, how would you build a system that operates um, at, at 300K? And uh, are there other ideas, you know, do you use the noise, uh, you know, in, in some way rather than, you know, try to get rid of it, which you have to do in some way, and how would that really work? Um, so that's really what, what I hope will, will come out of this. So our next speaker is Christopher Rogers from Oxford and he's going to talk about the quantum mechanics of bird navigation.